we're going to be in Ezekiel chapter 4. Uh, we're going to start in chapter 3, verse 17, just very briefly, and then go on to chapter 4, 5, and 6. Um, don't worry, we'll stop for lunch halfway through. But <laughs> Ezekiel is, you know, they get to go and talk about mercy and grace. We get to talk about judgment and not a light couple chapters we got here. Uh, this is this is going to be incredibly difficult, and I think one of the the reasons Ezekiel is often unpalatable, we don't like the taste of it when we read it, is because I don't think we really understand how much God hates sin. I really don't think we realize how our sin of, offends God. If we really understood that, this book would not be nearly as shocking. Um, and so we often think, well. We, we often excuse our sin and thinking, and we get wrapped up in grace and mercy. But I think the Old Testament, and Ezekiel in particular, uh, sobers us a little bit into realizing that God still holds people to account for their sin. Now, what we are going to see is that though God holds people to account for their sin, he saw fit, and he chose to send his son to bear the penalty that we all deserve. That is incredible grace. But I think sometimes we don't understand the weight of the, the, the cost of our sin. And because of that, we don't actually see the beauty of the prize of Christ. So I really hope that you'll wrestle with me through the difficulty of Ezekiel a little bit. Uh, the awkward, the horrific, the, the disgusting. Because that is the consequence and the cost of sin. And when we're willing to see that, then Christ has magnified that much Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, this book. We thank you for the warnings that are in it. And yet we recognize that we are just like the Israelites. We're stubborn. We're, we're rebellious. We're naturally deceived in, in and of ourselves, thinking that we're good people and deserving of all these things. So, God, just forgive us for those things. Lord, in, in our hearts, I pray that you would just help us to see the, the weight and the depth of our sin and the cost that that, that is. I thank you that, that, Father, that Ezekiel was not the end of the story, um, that you brought about your great salvation, even when we were enslaved, we were foreigners apart from you. You saw fit to send your son to die for us and to bring us into this right relationship where we can be not just have our sins dealt with, but then to, to change the relationship that we have, even, even the relationship that we have with our own sin. Thank you that when we are saved, that you cause us to hate our sin more than we used to hate it. Because we know, and as you lead us, you help us to realize that you hate sin too. It has no place in your relationship. I pray that you'd help us with this passage, these passages today, these words. Um, help us to wrestle through them, to have our minds sobered, but also to reflect on your goodness in the midst of it. In Jesus' name. Okay, let's uh, let's jump to chapter three, verse seventeen. This is Ezekiel's call, which he talked about last time, and says, "Son of man, I have made you a watchman." I think that's a significant idea that we have Ezekiel standing on the city walls, looking out for the enemy, looking out for threats, immediate threats, and things that are going to come, so that he can in turn turn around to the city and warn the people, in the sense. And so we need to understand that Ezekiel's call is not just to do this in his own strength, but he is to be faithful. He has been given words to speak. God spoke to him. He's been given the spirit to do this powerfully. He's also been given a stubborn head that he's going to be uh, stubbornly doing this and warning the people. And in so doing now, what we're going to see in the next few chapters, chapter 4, 5, and 6, are stern warnings in, for the immediate people. These aren't prophecies that are still going to happen for us. These are prophecies that did already happen. In our, from our perspective, they've already happened. From Ezekiel's perspective, they're coming. They're just over the horizon. And so his call as a watchman is, is very urgent. It's not just like, oh, something's going to happen someday. No, this is going to happen, and God has given him words to say, and not just words to say, but at the end of chapter 3, it says, now go into your house and shut yourself in there, and you're going to be bound up. You're not going to be able to say or do anything until such a time as I release you. 
And I think that's really critical here that we get that, that now in chapter 4, Ezekiel is being released to do and to speak the messages that God has to warn the people. And so what he's going to do first is to put on a little street performance. He's going to have a drama in chapter 4 that gives a picture of what's going to happen to the city of Jerusalem. Then in chapter 5, we're going to have a drama um, about what's going to happen to the people of Jerusalem. Then in chapter 6, what we're going to have is a message, a prophecy, explaining the heart of God in the midst of all this. Why is God doing this? And that's what chapter 6 is going to be all about. But I think we need to take all these three together. So we're going to read through it. I'm going to offer very little commentary as we go. It speaks for itself, um, but just so we understand it. Has anyone read ahead and gone, is reading through Ezekiel? Do that. Obviously no one else is, so you're leaving that up to me. Chapter 4, here we go. Now, son of man, take a, a brick of clay, put it in, a, in front of you, and draw the city of Jerusalem on it. Then lay siege to it. Erect siege works against it. Build a ramp up to it. Set up camps against it and put ba battering rams around it. Then take an iron pan, place it as an iron wall between you and the city, and turn your face towards it, and it will be under siege, and you shall besiege it. This will be a sign to the people of Israel. So basically he tells Ezekiel, go and build a model. Go and build a model of Jerusalem. Maybe out of Lego. We would think sort of like he builds this Lego model and then he puts like, builds little siege things that like uh, battering rams and stuff around it. And he's supposed to do this while he's among the people from his house. He's sitting on the street corner and he's building this model. And imagine kind of building like, like model trains or pictures like that, but he's going to build this giant model that every day he's going to go out and he's going to keep modifying and building and building more and more of. And the first thing is to get a big brick and put that big brick down and write on it, this is the city of Jerusalem. Or maybe even that brick, scratch it out and shape it so it looks like Jerusalem. And then I want you to, to build little models of ramps and camps and armies and all these different things surrounding Jerusalem and you're going to do that for a long period of time. This is going to show, it's going to be a model of what's going to happen in the future here. And so just this is a street performance in a sense, supposed to be done in the sight of the people, so that other people could come along like, hey, Ezekiel, what are you doing? What are you building? And Ezekiel would have an opportunity then to just show them this is what's going to happen. This is Jerusalem. And if we get some great insight, why? Why would he want this to, to happen? Verse 3, it says at the very end, this will be a sign to the people of Israel. It was to show, to show the people of Israel what is going to happen. Then, what I want you to do after you built this model is to lie on your left side, uh, put the sin of the people of Israel upon yourself, meaning bear the weight of your sin. So if you think of having to lean on your side for a long period of time, leaning on your elbow, it's basically the body weight is on your elbow, and you, just to feel the weight of that on the people. So he's saying, I want you to picture a little bit about what my, what the, how this is weighing on me. The weight of the sin of the people, or the, the judgment of the people is sort of on, on you in this way. You're going to lay on your left side, and I have assigned you the same number of days as is the years of their sin. So for 390 days, you will bear the sin of the people of Israel. That doesn't mean he did this for 390 days straight. I, I don't know that for sure, but I would propose that he went home. There was times of his performance, 8 to 10 or whatever. And there was times throughout the day where this was his whole job was to sit in front of his model, lay it on his side, and uh, and then to explain to people as they passed by what was going on. And then he would go home at night, and he would sleep, and then come back to his model the next day. But it was a full-time job. This was to prophesy over and over and over and over again. Um, imagine, um, I, I don't know, maybe you can imagine it. I have a hard time. And after you have finished this, or the 390 days, lie down again, this time on your right side and bear the sin of the people of Judah. So we have Israel and Judah, the northern and southern kingdoms, and he's supposed to represent that by 390 days on one side for one group of people, and then 40 days to show that the other people maybe had not gone as long in this, in this struggle, but nevertheless, they bear the weight of that sin. So Israel and Judah being two, two sort of separate states of the same country or the same people, okay? Verse 7, turn your face to the wind, or to the toward the siege of Jerusalem and with um, sorry and with bared arm prophesy against her bared arm is ready for battle ready to strike 
I will tie you up with ropes so that you cannot turn from one side or to the other until you have finished the days of your siege. And the ropes were to be that this is going to happen. It's bound, not not going to change, okay? So you're bound, this is destiny, this is going to happen for sure. So this is the word that God gives to the people through a street performance. Second part of the street performance here for the city is this is what's going to happen. Now I want you to take wheat and barley, uh, uh, beans and lentils, millet and spelt, these are all different types of grain, put them in a storage jar and use them to make bread for yourself. You are to eat it during the 390 days that you lie on your side. Weigh out 30, sec 30 shekels, or sorry, 20 sec shekels of food to eat each day and eat it at set times. Also measure out a sixth of a hin of water and drink it at set times. Eat the food as you would a loaf of barley bread. Bake it on, in the sight of the people using human excrement for fuel. Mmm, yummy. Ready for potluck, anyone? I brought special bread. Ezekiel would not have likely been invited to your house for food or to, to come in and bring for the potluck. But here, the symbolism is this, that within the siege, you're going to have food rations. So there's weighted food, weighted water, and it's going to be cooked over dung. Now, there's a few reasons for this. This is exactly what was going to happen and did happen historically to the nation or to, to the city of Jerusalem. While they were there, as the siege went on and on and on, their food storages started to go lower and lower and lower. And so they had rationed food, a certain portion for each person at certain portion or certain times of the day. And on top of that, they had burned through all their wood. They'd actually burned up their houses. They'd burned all the things that they had to try to bake the bread. And it came to the point where they actually were doing exactly what God told uh, Ezekiel to do. There's another part to, I think, the motivation why God would bring this about. You see, the nation of Israel did a lot of things that appeared holy. There were certain things that they would eat and would not eat, and they would do and not do, and they did all of those things, or many of them. But at the same time, they would add certain things like, well, yeah, we're going to follow God. We're not going to eat pork. We're not going to do all these different things. We're not going to defile ourselves in that way. But our hearts want to go after other gods. We want to do other things too. And so they, they did the things that they thought would satisfy God by, to be clean ceremonially. But then they would turn around and do extra things that they revealed that their hearts were not right before the Lord. So what God's going to do in bringing this about by not only this, but later on eating their own children it got so desperate that they would start eating the people who had died in the starvation, in the famine. And so in this way, they had to, to stay alive, become unclean ceremonially. So what God brought them to the point of not just looking like good people, but revealing that you are completely unclean before me. And so spiritually, he's giving them the condition of who they are. They are absolutely, no questions asked, spiritually dead. It's as disgusting as eating your, eating your food cooked over human dung. And so it's going to make this whole idea of defiled or pure or clean, it makes that clear in the next few verses here, okay? The Lord said in this way, verse 13, in this way the people of Israel will, be, will eat defiled food among the nations where I, will, where I will drive them. And so it's a prophecy that they are now defiled. They cannot come into his presence in, the, in their present condition. So the, it's showing the condition of the people's heart before the Lord. And so in their judgment, they are, they are defiled. And this is, again, like I said, I think it's really important that we understand how much our sin offends God. Just as this is an offensive thing for us to hear, God gives really interesting instructions. I'm just going to pause and talk about this. Interesting instructions in place like Deuteronomy and Exodus, Leviticus, for the people. He, he gives them strange instructions. Like every person should carry a little shovel so whenever you have to relieve yourself, you, have a, you can bury it. Well, that's not just for sanitation purposes. He also goes on and he says, so that when the Lord walks among you, then he won't have to see this defilement of the land. Isn't that interesting? And so it's kind of this idea that, that even, even these things, we, we don't understand even the, the purity of God to the point where where our defilement actually offends God. Now, it's a natural thing, we'll say, but God has given us ways that we're supposed to 
cover it up or to to make sure that we are walking in a right manner so that when he wants to walk with us, he is not offended. Just think of that. Keep that in mind as we keep going. Then I said, no way. No, sovereign Lord. I have never defiled myself. This would also have been the cry of many of the people. From my youth until now, I have never eaten anything found dead or torn by wild animals. No impure meat has ever crossed my mouth. Very well, he said to him, I love this, that God reasoned with Ezekiel a little bit. Very well, he said, I will let you bake your bread over cow dung instead of human. Oh, that's much better. Thank you, God. Doesn't matter. It is defiled food. And yet, God minimizes the offense to Ezekiel. And I appreciate that. So Ezekiel, being a priest, has tried to keep himself pure and was just going to enter the service. And at this point, he says, God, no, I don't, I don't want to do this. And yet God makes it clear that the message is firm and it's going to happen. And he then said to me, Son of man, I am about to cut off the food supply in Jerusalem. The people will eat rationed food in anxiety and drink rationed water in despair. For food and water will be scarce. They will be appalled at the sight of each other and will waste away because of their sin. Elsewhere it's going to say, that this siege would be worse than the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's worse in, in this way that God let them, Sodom and Gomorrah perish quickly. They didn't have to watch one another suffer. They didn't have to watch their family members die. They didn't have to, it, it just happened in an instant. And in this way, the destruction of Israel is is weighed, if, if I can say it that way. It's it's an appropriate punishment. What Sodom and Gomorrah did in their ignorance and rebellion towards God, Israel continued in their rebellion over and over and over again, rejecting the warnings, rejecting the cor correction of other prophets and people that were sent, rejecting the uh, what God had given them in the law, the instructions, just abs outright re in rebellion to things that they should have known better about. And so God then, by what they had seen and disobeyed, now they will see as a sign of their disobedience, the consequences of their disobedience. Moses made this really clear at the end of Deuteronomy, that if you follow me, all will go well with you. But if you will not, you will be treated like the other nations who rebel against you. And this is what's going to happen, but actually to a higher degree. Because of their rebellion to the revelation of God, now that it, they will see, it will be revealed to them what their disobedience cost them. Verse chapter 5. Now we're going to get a little symbol. This is what's going to happen in Jerusalem. It's going to be a horrible time. I want you to take note, though, how many times in 4, 5, and 6, God takes ownership of this. He doesn't say bad things are going to happen. Satan's probably behind them, but I'm off the hook. God makes special note to say, I will do this. I will bring this punishment. It will cause the starvation. I will stop the supply of food. I will bring the siege ramps. And he actually says the same thing to Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. And Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, God gave them into your hands. Nebuchadnezzar, you're a great warrior, great king, but God gave them to you. And so it's very clear. God's not trying to get himself off the hook. God is the one bringing the judgment on the people. I think that's critical for us to understand because God also brought their rescue to begin with, to make them people, to bring them into the promised land, gave them the, the conquering of Jericho and conquered all the nations and so that they could have this land, have this city. And now he is going to, in turn, take it away from them. So God has his hand intentionally in this. And that's hard to get, hard to understand. How could God do that? But we're going to see that God continues to have his hand, and this is, this is actually critical for us to grasp. But now let's, let's switch to the people. Now, son of man, take a sharp sword and use it as a, as a barber's razor to shave your head and your beard. Yes, another bald prophet. Then take a set of scales and divide up their hair. When the, days of your sie when the days of your siege come to an end, burn a third of the hair inside the city. Take a third and strike it with the sword all around the city and scatter a third to the wind, for I will pursue them with drawn sword. But take a few hairs and tuck them away in the folds of your garment. Again, take a few of the hairs of these hairs and throw them into the fire and burn them up. A fire will spread from there to all of Israel. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. This is Jerusalem, which I have set in the center 
of the nation. So, what is going to happen to the people of Jerusalem? Well, he does this by another drama. He says, after 390 days, I want you to get up and shave your head. So think of he's grown his hair and grown his hair, and he's got this big, long, bushy hair, and looked like a typical prophet, a little bit nuts, a little bit crazy looking. Not a little bit, a lot bit crazy looking. And now he tells them, shave all your hair off and then weigh it out, divide it perfectly into thirds. You have a pile of hair over here, another third, and another third. And then I want you to go and stand in front of this model with everybody watching, and he says, now I want you to burn up a third of that hair in the city of Jerusalem. Get rid of it. So that's going to be like the people in Jerusalem who are going to die in the siege. A third of the people are going to die. Then there's going to be a third that are going to be chopped to pieces as they attack and as they go back and forth. A third of them are going to be chopped to pieces. So I want you to go around the city and, and chop into little bits. Is this getting a little graphic? And then a third of them I want you just to throw it in the air and the hair is going to scatter to the wind. These are going to be the people of exile among whom Ezekiel is living. But there's another little, little, little portion you hear that? There's a little portion that I want to take. Want you to take. I want you to roll up a little portion of your hair, and I want you to put it in the, the cloak of your garment. Wrap it up, roll it up there, and keep it safe. But among that, I want you to take a few of those hairs and sprinkle them around in the fire as well. See, even that portion, that remnant, some of that faithful remnant that I'm going to keep for myself and I'm going to preserve in the midst of all this destruction and judgment, that even that a few of those people in the remnant are going to die. Either they're going to die at the sword of the Babylonians or are going to die and burn in the fire or, or whatever, whatever else. Even a portion of that remnant may not survive. But there is going to be a remnant. We need to keep that promise in mind as you go through the rest of the book of Ezekiel and as we look at Israel's history that God preserves a remnant though he brings judgment and justice on the nation. I want us also to note now that there is a measured response of God. God doesn't just keep executing judgment and anger forever. Let's read verse 5 and 6. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. This is Jerusalem, which I have set in the center of the nations. So this is why it bothers him so much, the way that they're acting. He put them there. He rescued them from Egypt. He gave them the land. And he put them there. We read this in the very first time. That God set them there to be his holy people, a representative, a light to the Gentiles, a light to all the nations around. And actually, even the location of Israel, even today, Jerusalem, is sort of a central focal point. Why there's so much conflict there even to this day. I set you in the center of the nations with count, uh, sorry, with, with countries all around you. Yet, in your wickedness, she has rebelled against my laws and decrees more than the nations and countries around her. She has rejected my laws and has not followed my decrees. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, you have been more unruly than the nations around you and have not followed the decrees kept or kept my laws. You have not even conformed to the standards of the nations around you. You don't even have the same standards as pagan nations. So I set you there to be an example, a light to the Gentiles, but you, you haven't even obeyed to the point where the other nations are obeying in their ignorance. Paul makes that clear later in the New Testament. He says, now there's even Gentiles who, in their ignorance, do what's right once in a while. It's unreal, but even but the Israelites, they can't do it. They even do even worse than that. So God's actually holding them to account because they had received revelation, but did nothing with it. And so he holds them to a higher standard than the rest of the nations around. And this, this higher standard is, is going to be important. I want you also to note that it's measured, that there's going to come a time we have a number of days or a number of years when this is going to happen, then it will come to an end, which we're going to read in a second. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. Uh, sorry, we're down to verse 8. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. We hear it again. I myself am against you, Jerusalem, and I will inflict punishment on you in the sight of the nations because of all your detestable idols. I will do to you what I have never done before and will never do again. Therefore, in your midst, parents will eat their children and children will eat their parents. I will inflict punishment on you and will scatter all your survivors to the wind. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, because you have defiled my sanctuary with your vile images and idols and detestable practices, I myself will shave you. I will not look on you with pity or spare you. A third of your people will die in the plague and, and perish of famine inside you. 
this is to Jerusalem, the people of Jerusalem. A third will fall by the sword outside your walls, and a third will scatter to the winds and pursue with drawn sword. Then, I love this, then my anger will cease, and my wrath against them will subside, and I will be avenged, and what I have spent my wrath on them, they will know that I am the Lord, I the Lord have spoken in my zeal. Now, I want to pause there for a second. This is the other part of a measured response. There is justice here because of the revelation that he's given them and and he's holding them to account for that. It's going to be public, it's going to be grotesque and horrible. This is the cost of their sin. And yet, he says, my wrath will come to an end when this happens. He's not going to stay angry forever. So he says there is is a just punishment for what, what it is, and when that is done, it's done. And so I think this is, this is critical for us to understand, too, because sometimes, as, as we make a New Testament tie here, sometimes we can get this idea that God is eternally angry forever. And yet, when we trust, our, trust Christ to pay the penalty for our sins, his wrath is completely poured out on Jesus. Does that make sense? He doesn't carry this on, and there's, there's 25 more things that he's going to, yeah, he hold, held Jesus to account for some, but we need to make amends for a whole bunch of other things. That's on us. No, his wrath is paid in the death of Jesus. We'll talk about this. I will make you... uh, By the way, a shaved head is a sign of shame. So when he says that I will shave you, just as he did with Ezekiel, he was supposed to be a, a symbol. Ezekiel was supposed to be a symbol of God, but also a symbol of the people. And so to the people, Ezekiel was... They had mocked God. They had brought shame on God's name in the same way that they were going to suffer shame, just like with a shaved head. So thankfully we've changed culture. A shaved head is a sign of wisdom and uprightness. and Right? Right? Yes. Yes. Good answer. Verse 14. I will make you a ruin and a reproach among the nations around you in the sight of all who pass by. You will be a reproach and a and a taunt, uh, uh, yes, a warning and an object of horror to the nations around you. Why is God doing this? God is doing it not just to punish Israel, but to show the nations around the cost of being in rebellion to God. That's going to be critical. Otherwise, the good news is not good news, right? The good news is not just good news to the Israelites. The good news is good news to all nations. When Christ comes, it will be to rescue all nations from the wrath of God. That's critical that the nations around would understand that we may not escape this either. And in fact, uh, Babylon would suffer very much the same fate as Jerusalem. It would be under siege for, like, years. They would eat their own children. It was actually to the point where the rulers and the upper class had to, they were told by the king's decree, pick your favorite wife, and your favorite son. The rest kill. They're taking out too many groceries. So it's, Babylon went through the exact same thing. And so, glad, anyone else glad we don't have to make those kind of decisions today? Verse 16. When I shoot at you with my, my deadly and destructive arrows of famine, I will shoot it and destroy you. I will bring more and more famine upon you and cut off the supply of food. I will send famine and wild beasts against you, and they will leave you childless. Plagues and bloodshed will sweep through you, and I will bring the sword against you. I, the Lord, have spoken. And when the Lord speaks, what happens? Whatever he says will happen. That's what happens. Chapter 6. Let's go here for... We're going we're gonna to read the chapter a couple times. The word of the Lord came to me again. Son of man, set your face against the mountains of Israel, prophesy against them, and say, you mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Sovereign Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to the mountains and the hills, to the ravines and the valleys. I am about to bring a sword against you, and I will destroy your high places. This isn't against just the physical landscape. This is a curse against the places that they worshipped other gods. In ancient custom, not just Israel, but everywhere, they often put shrines on the top of mountains. It was the place where they thought they had to ascend to get to the into the presence of God, and so they would set these shrines and different things on the top of the mountains. This is what it means by high places at the end of verse 3. 
this, the high places that he's talking about, where you worship all those other gods, curse them. Curse this land. You defiled the whole land that was supposed to be my land for you. But he says you filled it with a whole bunch of other idols. So now curse them. Verse 4. Your altars will be demolished and your incense altars will be shattered and I will slay your people in front of your idols. I will lay the dead bodies of the Israelites in front of the of their idols and I will scatter your bones around your altars. Where, man, this is easy to read, isn't it? Wherever you live, the towns will be laid waste and the high places demolished so that your altars will be laid waste and de- devastated, your idols smashed and ruined, your incense altars broken down and what you have made wiped out. Your people will fall slain among you and you will know that I am the Lord. Underline that. Come back. But I will spare some. For some of you will escape the sword when you are scattered among the, na- the lands and nations. Then in the nations where they have been carried captive, those who escape will remember me. How I have been grieved by their adulterous heart, which I have turned away from me, which have turned away from me, and by their eyes, which have lusted after their idols. They will loathe themselves for the evil that they have done and for all their detestable practices. And they will know that I am the Lord. I did not threaten in vain to bring this calamity to them. Those verses, we just want to camp there just for a second. I think it's important, verse 7, the end of verse 7, it says, Then they will know that I am the Lord. And then it's going to say it again. Then they will know that I am the Lord, verse 10, it says that. But they've, God wants to make clear what his motivation is. Why does this bother him so much? Why does Israel's sin bother him so much? Verse 9. Um, very merciful verse in verse 8, but verse 9 is important. Then in the nations where they have been carried captive, those who escape will remember me. How will they remember something that they didn't already know? See, they already know who God is, but they've rejected him. There's, there's no ignorance here. So they've rejected, they've rejected God, not only God himself, and they will also remember, though, how I have been grieved by their adulterous heart. It gives this powerful illustration. It's like a husband with a cheating wife. This is what it's been like for me, God. To watch you go, and in, in the original language, to watch your whoring. Watch you to go from one person to another, one God to another, one idol to another, and forget about me, and then to come home and claim that you love me. That's what it's been like for me. So it says that I've been grieved by your adulterous heart. What a, what a statement. Now you can kind of understand a little bit why God responds how he does. Anyone else maybe come off the handle if that happened to you? Probably come off the handle. You might smash some stuff around the house. Maybe we don't have the power to go about these same acts of judgment here. But remember the God that has been sinned against. He is the one that created everything. He is the one that rescued them. He is the one that gave them the land. He is the one that has provided for them and spared them, given them the law, given them prophets, given them people to protect and preserve them. Oh, man. And yet they turn and walk away. Then, verse 10, then they will know that I am the Lord. And I did not threaten in vain to bring this calamity upon them. Down to verse 13, and then they will know that I am the Lord. When their people lie slain among the idols um, around their altars on very high hill and on all the mountaintops. Down to verse 14, the end of verse 14. Then they will know that I am the Lord. This is going to be repeated 60 times in the book of Ezekiel. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Everything that God does show that he is God, there is no other. Why would we go anywhere else? I think the good news is, is that in one of the contemporaries, let's go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 52. All of us, the wages of sin is death, correct? The Bible is very clear on this. The cost of our sin is eternal punishment because we sinned in, against an eternal God. He's promised us eternal life, and yet if we choose to reject him, then we are we're doomed to eternal punishment. Punishment for our sins is also 
a just punishment. It's a measured punishment. Um, it's one that is uh, deserving, and yet it's it's harsh. It seems harsh. But that's because he's also given us the solution. And so should we reject the solution that he's given us, we have chosen our own destruction. This is Israel chose her when they didn't listen to the warning. Isaiah 53. Remember I said over and over again um, that God is the one orchestrating all of this. He's not trying to get off the hook at all. Now, let's read verse 4. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquity, and the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we have been healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, and each one of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Does Jesus sound like pretty good news? There is, there is yet a remnant of people who put their faith in Christ and trust Him with Him. The provision of Christ is there to bear the punishment that you and I deserve, just like Israel did. These verses are, are harsh and brutal, but all of this God does so that we would know that He is God. There is, there is no one like God. Who else, what other God would send a rescue plan like that, that would give his own son to die so that you and I don't have to. To forgive the sins of Israel, who constantly cheated on him, rejected him, rebelled against him. What, what other God would do that? that? There is no one like our God. Then you will know that I am the Lord. I think we're going to be shocked as we keep going over and over again that we're going to see a faithful God, but a a just God, we're going to see a giving and merciful God, and yet we're going to see a God who punishes sin because sin is horrific towards him, and we need to understand the weight of it. And we're going to see that our offense to the Lord is dealt with in the, in the promise, not just to fix the problem of sin, but to fix the problem of a rebellious heart. When we get most of the way through Ezekiel, God is going to prophesy, I'm going to give you my spirit, I'm going to give you a new heart, and then you'll be able to follow me. You'll want to go after me. You won't want to go anywhere else. And so he doesn't just fix the sin and the consequences. He fixes the root problem that our hearts are in rebellion towards the Lord. Then you will know that I am. What a drama that plays out in front of the people. I think we'd be foolish to ignore it ourselves. Let's pray. Father, we're going to come to the Lord's table here. And... Uh, we recognize that this Lord's table is a symbol of incredible celebration. And yet, it's celebration because it was Christ's blood that was shed for us. So there is a weight to the celebration that we don't want to miss today. That as we take communion, that we would not waste the words or the implications of it. What the cross shows, Father, is how devastating sin is. How much of it is an offense to you. Lord, the cost of our sin as well. So I pray that we would take these elements, the bread and the wine here, as, as the symbols of what you have offered on our behalf. I pray that we take them in celebration, rejoicing with, with each other at the taking of these elements. So just stir our hearts, help us to be sober minded today. We take this help and not help us not to take this in vain or with vanity. Um, understand how much it shows that you love us, how patient you have been, and yet the very real cost. Thank you for this these, these symbols in Jesus' name.